Amen. First Corinthians 3, we're going through a series that we're just picking some of those passages that say, do not be deceived, let not your heart be deceived, etc., etc. This one is very interesting. Let me start it off with asking you two different questions. Who is the smartest person you know of? The smartest person you know of. Okay, I'll give you some samples to see if you agree. Uh, Einstein, Da Vinci, uh, Hawking, Thomas Edison, Musk, smart man? Okay, the fellow all the way to your right, he has been recorded as the highest IQ, 250 to 300 is his IQ. You know the person all the way to the bottom on the right, we're being told she is the smartest person in the world, okay? Um, the one that's right next to her, the oriental gentleman, Kim Wong Young, at the age of four, he was reading and writing in three different languages proficiently. So one of those child prodigies. So we look and we say, okay, these are some of the, what, what's being touted as the smart people. But let me ask it a different way. What does it take? Is wisdom and smart the same thing? No, no, okay. What's it take to be wise? It takes the Lord, okay, okay. What's the difference between being wise and being smart? Okay. All right, go ahead. Whoever, somebody piped up. Common sense? I think said Romans 6, and I wasn't sure where that was. Okay. It helps to hear. Okay, wise people can hear. I can't. Okay, common sense? Okay. Is it, would you agree with that? Wisdom is having more common sense than just being, what's that? Experience helps building up wisdom. Okay, what we're talking about is we're talking about wisdom this evening, not just being smart, but being wise. Now, the Bible talks a lot about wisdom. You just heard one of the kids quote one of the verses that talks about the fear of the Lord is the beginning of the wisdom. For the Lord gives wisdom, his mouth, that produces knowledge, understanding. Fools despise it. Proverbs has another verse, the one who gets wisdom loves life. One who cherries his understanding will soon prosper. Who is wise and understanding above you? Let them show by a good life, common sense, and how we live our life by the deeds done. Ephesians, which we heard about this morning, is be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. In, in, that's a different translation. The translation we worked with this morning was re, redeeming the time. Okay, and so we talk about this idea of wisdom, and so when we come to 1 Corinthians, we're going to be in chapter 3, but I want you to understand chapter 1, 2, and 3 has a lot of comments about wisdom. There's a whole lot there. Now, this is really important for us to take a moment to talk about, because most of us think we are wise. I base that upon the survey of Americans that is done by American Institute of Education that says that 67% of all Americans believe that they are above average when it comes to wisdom. And so the problem that we have for most of us, me included, is sometimes we think we are wiser than what we really are. And so we need to be, say, okay, what according to the Word of God is real wisdom? And so we go back and we say, okay, let's set the scene for 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is where we're going to be looking at, and then we're going to bounce back to chapter 1. In 1 Corinthians, he is writing to a church that is obviously, in an, it's in the land of Greece, you understand that, but understand their society. The Greeks were really, really emphasizing the word wisdom, Sophia. They had a big emphasis upon them. They had all all these philosophers that some of you know some about these philosophers or literally lovers of wisdom uh, that is phileo sophia to put together and so you know of some of these famous greek philosophers do you, do you remember any of them from any of your reading studying okay Okay, See, okay. You've, you've mentioned several of them, the Socrates, the Aristotles, uh, or Aristotles, and different individuals. And so they were promoted as the heroes. When you read any of the Greek history, you read more of that. You have some of the Spartans and things like that, but these are the people that they are usually elevating in Greek society back then and even today when they look back in their history. And those philosophers would answer the major questions that most people have, the questions that still come up today that people want to have answered. You know, who made me? Why am I here? 
Um, where am I going? What is my purpose? And so the philosophers back in the ancient world, they were going to try to describe that. And they were going to give lessons what they understood about the spiritual realm. And the Word of God talks about how that they would do that. They would try to explain God. We're going to read about, or we're going to come into it probably about the beginning of October. We're going to get into that time where Paul goes into Athens, and it's a city given to philosophy and philosophers, and he's going to try to explain the Lord God to them as the only one in truth. God. And so what they did is they would, they would elevate, in their society, they elevated philosophers. In our society, we elevate, politicians can ele be elevated, sports people, celebrities, entertainers, yes? Okay, back in their society, the people that were really the elevated one were the philosophers. And so people would line up and they would say, okay, I am a student of or a follower of, you know, and they would give the names and they would be those ites, that they would follow those, you know, uh, Socrates or Aristotle or Euclid, they would be the Euclidites. And so they would do that. Now what happens is the people in Corinth get saved. They still bring with them some of their background. They bring their culture with them, just like you and I. We, we get saved and sometimes we put culture right in with our Bible worship and different things like that. And so they were bringing with them this idea of emphasis upon wisdom. And they were also bringing with them this idea of having favorite teachers. Now Paul writes about that and says you can't do that in the church. In the church you're not supposed to be you know, following celebrities or you know, the philosophers and elevating certain people just because they have a new teaching. And so he warns about that in the midst of all of this. And so he's going to talk in the first three chapters about this idea of properly loving wisdom or what type of wisdom. And so 30 times he's going to mention in the first three chapters, Sophia, the word for wisdom. And he's going to talk about it. Now we're looking at just a couple of the passages. Go to, we're going to be in chapter 3, back up to chapter 1, and you'll get the sense as we get started. Chapter 1, I would just want to jump in the middle of this conversation where he's going to make some comments about this idea of wisdom. He's going to say in verse 18, chapter 1, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish, what do they call the cross? foolishness. For, but it, unto us it's that, that are saved. It's the power of God unto salvation. And he says, for it is written, written, I'm going to destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of those who consider themselves prudent. Where is the wise person? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made the foolish the wisdom of this world. And so he's going to be talking about a little bit further about that in verse five, 25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of men. And the weakness of God is stronger than the strongest of men. You go to chapter 3 where we're going to be making our focus here. He says in chapter 3 verse 18, let no man or stop letting people deceive you. And then he explains what he means. If any among you seems to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be truly wise is the idea. For the wisdom of this world is what? It's foolishness with God. For it is written, he takes the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are empty or vain. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. And then he goes on and gives another command that ties the three commands in this passage together. And so Paul is writing, and this isn't the only book he has to write to, or write about this. He writes even in the letter of Colossae. He writes in the letter of Philippians, same, same thing. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy through the false teachings and after the traditions and not after Jesus Christ. What he is saying is that in this world we have a conflict that is going on. Worldly wisdom versus Jesus Christ or godly wisdom. And we as believers need to be very careful. We don't get caught up with worldly wisdom, but we get caught up with the wisdom from the Word of God. And so his emphasis here is on this idea of being very cautious. Now in our society, we've got the same thing going. We have the same thing where people are trying to explain where we came from, what is our purpose, how are we supposed to conduct ourselves, what's our destiny. And there are philosophical, ideological, there are, there are scholars trying to give all types of answers. For, for instance, human origination, the purpose for why we are here, what has it promoted from a worldly wisdom view, what explanation has come out of where did we originate? Evolutionism. Evolutionism that basically says man is a higher being. And man is becoming the highest of beings. What is left out of evolution? God himself. And it's all about man is good and perfect and developing and getting better and gooder and better and better. 
Okay, that's an evolutionistic philosophy, but is it a popular philosophy in our world? Okay, and the people who do not subscribe to that, how are they portrayed by society? What's that? We're mocked. Those who would say evolution isn't true, you're considered to be ignorant, denying science. You're, you're, you're one of those backwards people. And so ev evolution is one. Here's one. Ex seeking to explain man's inner self, how man is made up, what is the development of man, that has led to what we would call modern psychology. That is, man is innately good. And what makes man bad is his environment or his parents. Therefore, everything that's wrong with you, it's your parents' fault. And you don't have any culpability, any responsibility for it. You can just become a person who can say, I'm a victim. Have you ever heard some of this thinking and the idea that's being promoted? So you have this modern psychology. And again, we're not saying that anything to do with psychology is bad, nor are we saying anything to do with science is bad, but we're saying what do you do with those things and how you interpret them? Here, I'll give you one this way, okay? We talk about redefining. There's a whole element that came very popular in the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, and has just exploded exponentially in the theological realm of how do we define div divinity? How do we define the Almighty? That has led to what we're going to call liberal or progressive theologies, that have come to the point that we explain away the miracles. We explain that there is no different deity, that really deity is within you, that you are divine. And so what that basically has done, it has turned to false philosophies spiritually and has basically denied the Almighty and deified the creation, us. And so we have that, that's just, that's just happening in our society. It's happening in Christianity. It's happening in our world that we face some of this same emphasis upon, you know, the scholarship, quote unquote, and I say that tongue in cheek, the scholarship of these different ideas that are lacking common sense. Okay, let me, let me illustrate. To just say that something just came together that just developed in such detail to form the human body is just, it, it makes no sense. It, it, within that whole evolutionary theory, there are, there are big gaps in their explanation, and yet people swallow it hook, line, and sinker. And so we've, we run into this all the time. And what really causes me concern is how are those who are saying, we don't agree with uh, the idea of progressive theology, we don't agree with modern psychology, we don't agree with the idea of evolution, you are put down as not being wise, not being smart, not being... Put over whatever word you want. In fact, how are most Bible believers portrayed in TV? Are they, are, they usually the, are they usually portrayed as not educated? Are they usually portrayed as being bigoted? Being angry people? Very prejudicial? And so that, that's just a common, a common occurrence in our society that those who think they are wise put down spiritual truth and spiritual holders to truth. And so what we have is what happened in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. If you're not a student of history, you miss out on some of the, this important stuff that what happened in a lot of the schools. Um, Hey, did you know that all the major, like Harvard, Yale, Princeton, all those schools, do you, do you know why they were originally founded? They were seminaries for teaching the Word of God, and they were teaching Orthodox Christianity, okay? And so what happened is, as they became intellectual and more aware and progressive in their thinking, all of a sudden they came to become Bible deniers, 
deniers of miracles, deniers of God in the flesh, deniers of a need for a, a blood atonement, deniers of those types of things. And so what happened in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s is the Christians who wanted to be accepted within those same realms of what's called scholarship, to be accepted, Christians had to start adopting some compromising beliefs and practices because I don't want to appear ignorant uh, in their eyes. I don't want to be put down by them. So what I'm going to do is because they all don't believe in the supernatural like I do and they believe that there was evolution, what I'm going to do is I'm going to adopt a whole new Bible philosophy that says a day with the Lord is as a or a thousand years with the Lord is as a day. Okay, so I'm going to start reinterpreting the book of Genesis and saying a, instead of a seven-day creation, I'm going to have seven millennia of creation. And that'll agree with evolution, and therefore I'm not considered ignorant anymore. I just start off with a designer. And I still agree with all those millions and millions of errors of evolution, and now I'm accepted in that group. Instead of saying, wait a minute, I don't need their approval to be wise in the eyes of God. Okay. And so what, they, what happens is there's this real danger. And in this text, he points out some dangers of worldly wisdom. Chapter 1, verse 20, 21. Let's back there and just highlight this. And man, we're not getting far at all. Okay. Um, he says in verse 21, look at the, the second half of it. He says um, in this text that, that the idea of these ancient philosophers, that the danger of them is they redefine God, where it says that it's the, yeah, verse 21, for after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. They knew him not. What did they do? What does Romans say that people did with what knowledge of God that they had? They changed the knowledge of God into, into a foolish idea. They changed the truth of God into a lie and started worshiping the creature more than the creator. There's a danger in this idea. Look at verse 17. The danger of worldly wisdom that we just illustrated with. It says that the, that the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. If I deny the supernatural, if I deny Jesus coming in the flesh, what do I do with the cross? The cross is just meaningless. It's just a man who is living a good example and sacrificing like any other person. It denies every man's need of salvation. It denies that Jesus is the only way to salvation. It comes to a point that it calls the gospel foolishness. And he says that to them, to them they think it's foolish. But to you, we say it's the power of God. And so we have to be very careful. He's saying to the believers, he's saying, now, folk, believers, don't get caught up in the trap of trying to be accepted by the worldly standard of wisdom. It's not a good standard. Stick with the standard of the Word of God and do this. Number one, you get, how to become truly wise is reject the claims of worldly wisdom. Reject the claims. Chapter 3, verse 18, where it's, he makes this comment. He says, Let no man deceive you. If any man among you seems to be wise in this world, let him become a fool. What does he mean by that? What does he mean? He says, okay, now he's warning. He's saying, some of you are being deceived. You're being caught up. This isn't good. You think you're a wise person based upon worldly wisdom. And you want to be accepted by what, what the teachers, the professors, the people in society, what they say is real wisdom. Don't get caught up with that. Don't get caught up in what the world says is wisdom, such as these things. Now, the world says having a degree makes you automatically wise. The world says if you agree with some of this liberal science, the liberal uh, religious thinking, then you're really wise. The world says that if you are an open thinker, that you tolerate all different points of view, man, you are a wise person. Let me give you an illustration of how it has afflicted and affected church people. There are Christians who would say, I question whether God really created in seven days. Why do you question that? It's not because of the Word of God. The Word of God clearly says that, he cre that there was the first day, second, third, fourth, fifth day of creation, and the morning and the evening were the... First day, there's, there's, there's no, nothing in Scripture that even hints at evolutionary creation. Nothing. 
it came from an idea of people saying, I'm going to be a modern thinking Christian. I'm going to try to find commonality with world's wisdom. Don't do that, he says. Don't do that. Here, I'll give you another one. Um, did miracles really happen in the Bible? Okay, there, there's explanations. I've talked about this on our Wednesdays and our Bible studies. For instance, the feeding of the 5,000. It's not a miracle of Jesus being able to create food enough to feed 5,000 men plus their wives and the kids. So 15, 20,000 people. That's not the miracle. The miracle really was that everybody shared what they had. Okay, and so they, they, they explain it away and that feels like I'm scholarly. Don't get caught up in that. There's Christians who question this. Was Jesus fully God? Or was he just a good man? And in Christian circles, this is a debate whether Jesus was really God. What do you do with I and my Father are one? Then there's this. People in Christian circles are beginning to question this idea. Are people really bad innately? Are people really sinners? Oh yeah, we know that we see them on the news, the ones who are the dregs of society, the criminals, the crooks, the molesters. We understand they're sinners, but are they really that bad, my nice neighbors, my nice relatives? Are they really that bad? Is, is the, word, the word of God didn't really mean that they're all sinners. It's just that the sinful people are sinners. And it's a progressive thinking that is explaining away belief of the Word of God. But the Word of God says, all have sinned, every one. There is none. Right? No. Okay, here's one. There is within even churches like ours a rethinking of what the Bible talks about in training up children. Okay, I'm a progressive thinker. I don't think corporal punishment is really a good thing to do. In other words, spanking a child. Because I live in a world that that's not really promoted anymore. And the way that we're really going to get across to our children is if we just give them positive reinforcement and only positive reinforcement. What do you do with the Word of God? How do you progressively outthink God's manual for parenting? When God clearly says that the rod of proof gives wisdom. What do you do with that? But you, some of you have gone through this. You've been challenged this way. You've sat in Bible studies where they're taking out elements of parenting from the Word of God and saying, I've got a better idea than God. There's, there's this. There's, within the Christian community, there is a rethinking of God's standard of purity. You know, well, yeah, I know. That's old school to say premarital sex is wrong. No, 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 no. That, that's 1 Corinthians 7. There, there, there's a new thought of how to view living together. It's not real. That's anti we're progressive. We're modern. We, we understand that the Word of God tells us that just because we're committed to re really loving God and loving each other, it's okay if we live together. It goes this way. There are even Christians that are rethinking this whole view of homosexuality. Does the Bible really say it's bad? Because God may have made them that way. Because that's what we keep hearing, is this is within the genetic code of people that are homosexual orientation. They can't help it. And so maybe we just need to rethink the Bible. Why are we trying to rethink God? Is God dumb in 2024? Is God's word lost its inerrancy? Has American, American teaching, have we outscaled God in wisdom? Okay, here's one. Churches should stop preaching against sin. I, I can give you all kinds of manuals and books and articles that talk about stop making people feel guilty. People need to be reassured how good they are. If they come to church and they're made to feel good, they'll want to come back to church. So Joel Osteen and all those others become popular and the gurus of our society. But they aren't preaching truth. 
They don't preach it. So he says, hey, we need to reject this. And he says, okay, now let's not, let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater. He is not advocating rejecting anything to do with science. He's not saying let's reject anything to do with medical advances. I am thankful we are advanced and advancing in dealing with disease and with illnesses. It's amazing, the heart surgeries, the brain surgeries, the cancer treatments. We ought not to just say, let's go back 200 years ago to what they had for science and medicines. None of us would want that. If you want that, go to a third world country and you'll crave to be back here after the first doctor's appointment. So this isn't saying we should get rid of all modern technologies. Because if we did, then you would have to walk home, get rid of your cell phones, and not watch TV, and I'd have to turn off this screen. Okay. We're not saying get rid of all of that. We're not saying this. Let's get rid of all modern counseling ideas. And modern, it, there are some real benefits from what has done, been done in the study of the mind. We now know about such things as dyslexia. We now know about such things in medicine like postpartum blues. We now know about things that are identified, such as autism. Aren't you glad that those are being identified to be able to minister? We shouldn't reject all of that, but as long as it's something that is taking us away from Scripture, we ought to reject it then. We need to make sure that we are not following the foolishness. And when it comes to our church, this same thing is true. Let me apply real quickly. We are not supposed to be running this church based on business wisdom. Okay, what we need for deacons is find the best businessmen in the church. I am not against any of the businessmen at all. I'd rather have godly servants to be the deacons than somebody who is greatly wise but carnal. Just because they're wise in business practices, I don't think they should be a deacon. They need the character. They need God's wisdom. But does it happen in churches that we elevate people with money, people who are successful by the world standard? Okay, here's one. We as a church ought not to get caught up in modern marketing. Now, should we be aware of doing some processing, of knowing our community and understanding that, but saying, okay, let's just use modern techniques of marketing and we'll build a church? No, we can't do that. We can't do that. Because if we use modern marketing, we never preach on hell ever again. But if we're true to the Word of God, do we need to preach on and talk about hell? Yes. Okay, here's one for you. We shouldn't use modern psychotherapies when we're counseling. If it's giving us some things that agree with Scripture, thumbs up to it. But Scripture has to be our standard, not psychology. When we go a little bit further, we ought not to adopt modern social values and opinions when we are ministering. If we did that, we would say, hey, from here on out, we are going to put a sign out that says, you know, <laughs> I'd rephrase that. We're going to put a, 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 a rainbow color flag out. No, there's no way we're adopting that. As long as I'm here, there's no way we're doing that. Okay. Even though it's a modern social opinion, yes? Okay, we can't do that. We just can't get it. Nor should we adopt modern theories about marriage. Modern theories of marriage say it's not that bad if people are getting divorced and living together. Divorce is not God's design, folk. It just isn't. Does it happen? Yes. Is it forgivable? Yes. Can people who have gone through it serve the Lord after, after they've, they've reckoned, dealt with it? Yes. But we should not be standing up here and advocating it. We should, that, that's a modern progressive thought. That's not what the Word of God teaches. The Word of God discourages it and tells the people to work at it, to be forgiving and to try to, to work because what God hath put together, man should not put asunder. Okay? And so we don't want to adopt those ideas. Why reject worldly wisdom for these reasons? Verse 18, it deceives people. For this reason, it pales in comparison to the wisdom of God. 
The wisdom of this world is absolutely nonsense in the mind of God. Worldly wise people, they're going to get caught up. That's what he means in verses, where he says in verses 19 and 20. These are Old Testament quotes. Talking about worldly wise people, they're going to get caught in the mousetrap of their own wisdom. And he warns about, he got an example in scripture, Haman who builds the gallows in all of his wisdom to try to get rid of the Jews, and what happens to Haman at the end? He's the one who's hanging on the, ha on the, on the, hallow on the um, gallows. Thank you, not the hallows. I knew I missed that one up. Okay. So this is an Arabian proverb. He who knows not and knows not that he knows not, he's a fool. Okay, Get away from him. He who knows not and knows that he knows not, teach him. That's this next point. The next command in this verse, which we'll get through quicker, is this one. It says, humbly submit yourself to God's revealed words of wisdom. Where do we get that from? Well, in this text where he says, if any of you, he says, verse 18, among you seem to be wise in this world, let him become a fool. Reject the world's wisdom, that he may become wise. Why is he saying that? What does he mean by that? That idea is not, not to be ignorant, but to become a fool by the world's standard. He's playing with words here. Go for worldly wisdom that the world calls foolishness. Go after the revealed word of God. Why is that? Because the revealed word of God is superior to anything that the world offers. God's wisdom is superior. As well, God uses his superior wisdom. You didn't get, get a chance. I did afterwards. Maybe some of you did. To talk with Tim for just a few minutes after he stayed here. You remember he said that they're going into public schools and they're teaching the word of God? Okay. They haven't seen, they, they, what did he say, 420-some professions of faith? But he said there's something else that's happening. He says, in the school systems, the school superintendent said, since we have started this and you're coming in with the Bible, hasn't made a difference within the structure of the school. In the structure of the school, it was chaos in trying to teach. You know, it was just the, the kids were out of control. The superintendent of one of the schools that they're dealing with told him, just the, right before they came home, said, since you've been doing the Bible study, the attitude of the kids overall has changed drastically. We have far less disciplinary problems in the school. The academic um, testing, whatever they're doing, it's going up just because of their exposure. Now, they're not all getting saved. I'm not saying that. But does exposure to the Word of God impact people? Yeah, because they're getting real wisdom instead of a false wisdom. And so you look at this and say, God uses the foolish things of the world. What the world considers fool. And I can give you examples of this, that God used the foolishness of Noah. What was really progressively thinking, wise thinking on Noah's part compared to what everybody thought? Noah's building an ark, and it never rained before. That makes no sense. But was it, what did Noah base it upon? The revealed wisdom of God's word. And so the day that the floods opened, what did everybody realize? Noah was right. Noah was a wise one. Okay, so is it wise for you to get in your car, load up the, the truck, and start moving, and just go until God says stop? Is that a wise thing to do? Let, let me rephrase that. Would any of you parents encourage, well, maybe that's the wrong illustration. Okay. No, seriously. Would you encourage your kids to just go with no plan? No. No. But did God use that in Abraham's life? He did. Now, that's not a standard for, that was for Abraham to follow the revealed word of God. What about walking around, we're going to take over the city, we're going to march around the city for seven days, we're going to blow our horns. What battle strategy wisdom was that? From man's point of view, it was foolish. But from God's point of view, following the revealed word of God, it was wisdom. It was successful. It didn't look real smart for those guys when Jesus said, go out and cast out your nets. Because they had been fishing all night, and they had nothing. And he says, go back out there and cast your nets. And they did it. Did it work? Yeah, it sank the boats almost, it says. They had so much. So what looked foolish in the mind of people was actually 
It was wise. Why? It was based upon the revealed Word of God. The revealed Word of God. And so you have to ask yourself this question, okay? In not, not saying, I need to be worldly wise to be acceptable, I need to be following the Word of God to be acceptable before God. So I have to ask, are you a truly wise parent in the way you're parenting? What is your standard for parenting? The Word or worldly counsel? What about a wise worker? People at work may say, don't give your best. Just kind of drag out the job. But is that what the Word of God says? What about the idea about being at school, wisdom at school, in association with others, and how you deal with others? What about this idea of handling trials and difficulties? What about the way you handle your finances? Are you Bible-wise, word-wise, let's do it this way, word-wise or worldly-wise? Word wisdom is that you're following the Word of God. So it brings us to our third thought as we conclude. It's this. Humbly rejoice in what gifts God has given you. Now here's where some of you are sitting right now. You're going, yeah, but I'm not as adept in the Word. I'm not as trained as others. No, stop. Stop doing that. Watch what he does. He says in this text, and he gets after this idea of us always elevating, looking at and comparing it with other people. Let no man glory in man, for all things are yours. Whether it be Paul or Apollos or Peter or the world or life, death, things present, things to come. You are Christ and Christ is God's. What's he mean by that? He's tying this thought right together with what has come before. The therefore ties it all together. And it's a command, just like do not be deceived. Do not keep on doing this. Do not glory in men. You're in a church and you're in a society that they elevate the highly educated, the philosophical individuals. And he says, please stop doing that. Stop glorying in other people. Stop elevating these people. Stop saying, well, those people are so much smarter than I in business or their degrees or their authors. And in America, we do this in the Christian realm. We get some author, we get some speaker, and we elevate them. Like they are the answer man just because they published a book. And I'm not condemning everybody who, I'm so glad. I've got, I've got a, a huge library. I'm thankful for the library and for the many who publish books. But just because somebody has a radio program, TV program, or have a book, that doesn't mean that they're your guru for all your answers and that you're inferior to them. That's his point. His point to this text is don't become a people follower. All things are yours. What's he mean by all things are yours? You don't have less knowledge than others. You don't have less abilities. Stop belittling yourself because you're younger, because you didn't have as much degrees as others, or you're at a different point in life. He says, now wait a minute. You believers, you've got what really counts, and he says it in this way. If you need wisdom, go to God, who imparts to all men without showing favoritism. You've got the Holy Spirit who guides into all truth. And in this passage, it says, you are the ones who have the answers to life. You do. You who are following the Word of God, you know how life started. You know what our purpose is here. You have the true answers to where true life is. So don't be intimidated by scientists who think that they, 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 they have so much better knowledge than you just because they have degrees. You guys have the common sense of the Word of God. You have the answers about life. You have the answers about death. Right? If you're saved, you have the answers about death. You know that death is not the end. It's just the beginning. You have the answers about where you're going to go after you die. You have the answers when he says about things present. What's he mean by that? You folk have the answers to what's really important in life. How am I supposed to live? How do I handle trials? How am I supposed to raise my family? You've got those answers if you've got the Word of God in front of you. You're not diminished compared to some scholar you are a scholar in God's eyes as long as you're following his word. You are brilliant. You have the answers about the things to come. You're the ones who are sitting there. You know about the future events. You know what's going to last. You know what to invest in. You've got all you need 
to live a wise life. And so that means, as such, we don't need to idolize some teacher, some preacher, some, some book writer, some conference speaker. If you're going to idolize anybody, idolize Jesus Christ, who you are in Christ and he's in God. You've got a connection with God Almighty that many scholars don't have. So you benefit from that. You don't need to run to somebody outside of God's Word. As such, don't belittle your own ability and wisdom and, and sense of determining the will of God as you read the Word of God and pray to Him. As such, we have no reason to doubt our fellowship and to run to somebody else. Do you know there are some people who do this? There are some teacher, preachers who are claiming this. If you want to really know God, come to me and I'll take you to God. Hey, if you want to know God, you go, to, you go to Jesus Christ. He takes you to the Father. There is one mediator and only one. So for you and I, man, we're in a great spot. With Christ, we've got all we need. We've, we, we are blessed with Christ. There's a writer who writes, and let me close with this. He writes about his childhood experience that he says, and I'll bore you with just reading. I had broken free of the constraints of my little neighborhood, and now I was on my own to experience the grand adventure for the first time. I felt like somebody, even on a big blue girl Schwinn bike, I was somebody. The bike even had saddlebags. As I crossed the railroad tracks and then rumbled over a small creek on the single-lane bridge, I realized that the bridge, which was made of wood and steel, was no big deal. But on that day... Long ago, it became a bridge too far for me. As I began to cross, four teenage boys stepped out onto the far side of the bridge. I intended to pass on by, and they had other things in mind. One of the boys grabbed my handlebars and spun my bike to an abrupt stop. Hey, where do you think you're going? He snarled. Another boy chimed in. Yeah, kid, where are you going? Instantly, I knew that they intended to beat me up. I was petrified. I couldn't fight or break free to run, so I stood there frozen. And suddenly one of the boys asked, What's your name? I answered him in a high-pitched pre-adolescent voice, Terry Wardle. The three remaining teenagers looked at each other and got very silent. Are you related to Tom Wardle? Tom was my older cousin who happened to play defensive end on the high school football team. I told them Tom was my closest cousin. They immediately backed off. One of the boys straightened out my shirt, started saying, hey, we were just having a little bit of fun, no harm. You're a great kid, and if anyone ever gives you trouble, you tell us, we'll take care of them for you. That was a formative day for me. I learned that simply being Terry Wardle was not enough to be respected, accepted, and safe. And in the panic of the moment, I had learned that in this unsafe ungenerous world, to attain any degree of success in life would demand much more than simply being me. Claiming a relationship to somebody much bigger than I was what I needed to survive in this world. My friend Paul put it so simply. He said, you are Christ and Christ is God's. You are in the best hands possible. And you're wise if you stay close to Christ. Father, help us not to get caught up in these philosophical ideas that the world bombards us with, but help us to hang on to your word and hold truth to it. Day in and day out, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for listening. Have a good week.